So I'm speaking this morning on being holy temples. Whoop. If you would like to open your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 4, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation all the way up to verse 10 if you're keeping notes. And it says, so keep coming to him who is the living stone, that's Jesus, though he was rejected and discarded by men, but chosen by God and is priceless in God's sight. Come and be his living stones who are continually being assembled into a sanctuary for God. For now you serve as holy priests, offering up spiritual sacrifices that he readily accepts through Jesus Christ. For it says in Scripture, Look, I laid a cornerstone in Zion, a chosen and priceless stone, and whoever believes in him will certainly not be disappointed. As believers, you know his great worth. Indeed, his preciousness is imparted to you. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected and discarded has now become the cornerstone and the stone that makes them stumble and a rock to trip over. They keep stumbling over the message because they refuse to believe it. And this they were destined to do. But you are God's chosen treasure. Put your hand up if you're God's chosen treasure. Priests who are kings. Well, we're not just making this stuff up. Priests who are kings. A spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. For at one time you were not God's people, but now you are. At one time you knew nothing of God's mercy because you hadn't received it yet, but now you are drenched with it. Drenched in mercy. Amen? You know, sometimes you read passages of Scripture and you're like, that's enough. If, like, if that was the Bible, you'd be like, that's enough. But there's so much more, but I mean, it's kind of like, wow, so much goodness in there. But from the beginning of time, you know, from, from I guess, even creation, God was building a kingdom of priests and kings priests who are kings, not as separate things, but priests who are kings. You know, from creation, that's what it was. Adam and Eve in the garden, fellowshipping with God, uh, taking dominion over creation. That's a kingly kind of function, ministering to God and having dominion over creation. So from the beginning, it's always been God's intent to fulfill this. But in Christ, we see the establishment on the earth of this phenomenon, the, the re-establishment of it essentially. So what was lost in the fall was reclaimed in Christ. And now we are in this season of God building a holy nation of priests who are kings. And that's you and me. Amen. So it's a people that host his presence in the temple of their own bodies and manifest his presence through kingly rule in the world. Your life is way more important than you probably think it is. If you've ever wondered what the calling on your life is, it is this, to be a priest to God and a king to the world. It's, that's, it's really quite simple. Jesus said that the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with every part of your being, essentially, is what he's saying. And all of the, every message of God, every word spoken by the Father was really could be summed up in that little passage, just to love on God. And so we see, particularly in the Old Testament, the imagery of the Old Testament, a lot of the stories of the Old Testament, they were historical events that happened, but they were also prophetic imagery of what would be ultimately fulfilled in Christ. I've heard a guy called Tim Keller Uh, He's a pastor of a church in New York, kind of do this rundown where it talks about Jesus being the better version of all of these Old Testament kind of stories that we know of and and historical events. But he was the fulfillment of that. So Jonah and the whale, yeah, three days in the belly of the fish, you know, like all of that sort of stuff. Um, Isaac, when Abraham was went to sacrifice Isaac, 
So he makes his son carry the wood up the hill to the place of sacrifice. Yeah, and then he stands and he, and he sacrifices. He's about to sacrifice his son on the altar. And then the father says to him, stop. He says, but now I know that you love me because you would not withhold your one and only son from me. And so Jesus and the Father can now say, and we can say to him, we can say, Lord, we know that you love us because you would not withhold your one and only son from us. So as we look through and, and, and see this kind of biblical imagery going through, you know, marriage is another really important one as you, as you read in, in, I think it's in the book of Ephesians, where it talks about marriage ultimately being a representation of Christ and his church. That's why he's the bridegroom and we're the bride. And it's literally represented Every day, it's, it's an expression that we get to experience and live out and see in the lives of this marriage covenant is God with his bride. It's a, it's a natural image of a supernatural reality. So the temple is an image of God's dwelling place. So it was the reality in the, under the old covenant that there was a place that was established that was the dwelling place of God. That's where he was. He made himself contained to a place. And this is what happened when the, you know, when the temple was destroyed and they, or they were cast out of their land. It, it caused a big issue for the Israelites because they're like, well, where's God? He's not here anymore because the temple's been destroyed. But thankfully, it was only an image of something greater that was to come. And that was you and I becoming temples of the Holy Spirit. We have become a temple of God. We're a mobile tabernacle. He had to say, I'm a mobile tabernacle. Yeah. Say, so I'm an ark of his glory. So you know the ark of the covenant. You are the ark of his glory now. Every time, I know I say it probably often, but I'm like, it's just a ridiculous notion that God would make his home in us. So we host God in us. This idea of hosting the presence of God. Anyone heard that phrase, hosting the presence of God? Now, we want to do that corporately. I mean, that's what we're endeavoring to do this morning uh, when we gather together is to make a, a space and to, to praise the Lord and to just make space for Him to be and to create an environment where He loves to dwell. But the first place that we need to do that is within ourselves. So we host God in us so that we can host God among us, but we also host God among us so that people can learn to host God in themselves. So we come as our little mobile tabernacles and we all join together as, as a massive tabernacle and we create an environment where the Lord would come in a way so that when people enter in, they encounter the reality of God. And they're experiencing and they're like, I want some of that. And this is, again, you know, you've heard me talk about sometimes where we try to um, make our gathering times um, most comfortable for those who don't love God. In order that hopefully they'll fall in love with Him. But, but maybe He doesn't feel welcome in those places because everyone's catering for those who don't love Him. Rather than catering for the one that they love. Now I'm... I'm it, it, Maybe a really poor evangelistic strategy. But I reckon that as he's the desire of the nations, he's the one that everyone truly wants. That if we create an environment where God loves to dwell and we make him so comfortable and welcome and his presence so thick, that anybody that would come into that place would encounter him and they'd fall in love with him. They wouldn't encounter us. They wouldn't encounter the musicians or the, the decor. They wouldn't encounter any of those things because they'd encounter the Father. Anyway, that's not in my notes. Freebie. So the temple uh, was essentially made up. Solomon's temple had different kind of parts to it. There was the outer court, which was the place of worship, the inner court, uh, which was designated for the, the priests, and then there was the uh, most inner place, the Holy of Holies, which is where the presence of God dwelled. That was the place where the priests would one time a year kind of enter into that place, offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. Okay? So in the same way, there's these three kind of elements of the temple. And for us, we have those three kind of elements in, in, in imagery. We have our body, we have our soul, and we have our spirit. 
And so we know that when we are born again by the Spirit of God, that the Spirit of God comes and dwells with our spirit. That's that place of justification. That's that place where we're made anew, born anew. But now our soul is the part that's being kind of worked out. But that's the priestly function. That's where we become priests before the, before the Lord in our soul. So the Jewish temple was fashioned after the human spirit, soul, and body. Jesus showed us this after he cleared the temple of thieves. He was asked, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, Jesus. Are you going to raise it in three days? I know you're a carpenter, but that would be phenomenal. He says, but the temple he had spoken of was his body. That's John chapter 2, verse 13 to 19. You can read that little section. So as Jesus is saying, destroy this temple, he's speaking of himself. He understood himself as being a temple of the Holy Spirit. And now we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, that we are now a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. Does anyone feel holy this morning? Put your hand up. Rose does. Yeah, two people, three. (laughs) Yeah. You don't always feel it. But it's the reality. Because when God comes to a place, that place becomes like God. This is the reality I've heard Bill Johnson teach on it, where he says, you know, in the, in the old covenant, you wouldn't touch a leper because you would get, become unclean. But in the new covenant with Jesus, when Jesus touched the leper, the leper became clean. He got what Jesus had. And in the same way, when the Father comes to dwell in you, He makes you holy. Not because you did all of this stuff to make yourself holy, and it's like, okay, I guess I'll, I'll come and move in there. He's like, no, no, when I move in, I take ownership, and all that is there becomes everything like me. You've been made holy because God's Spirit dwells in you. Our job is to live out His holiness, not to try and make ourselves holy. But you you are infused with holiness. You've been consumed in your inner man by the holiness of God. You have received an impartation of the holiness of God because literally the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Are you feeling a little bit more holy right now? Because remember, it's not based upon your works, your effort, your doing. Before God, you've been made holy. You are holy and righteous in the Beloved. It's got nothing to do with you. So you can take that certificate off the wall that says, I've accomplished some measure of holiness this week. Because you feel it sometimes. I know I've spoken before on that uh, passage in Hebrews, and I was chatting to um, some Brett this week, and we're just talking about this, this passage in Hebrews where it's, um, you know, come boldly before the throne of grace so you might receive grace and mercy in your time of need. But it's saying, it's not this thing of where we go, okay, get my life right, and then I can come boldly before the Lord. No, no, you need to come boldly before the Lord because you need everything that He has in order to make your life right. It's like it's come with that hunger, come with that ferocity to say, God, I cannot do it on my own. And it's those who don't come boldly before the throne who are arrogant enough to think that they can do it without His grace and without His mercy. It can seem, you know, it's like that backward thing. Like saying, well, how could I, such a, a wretched, worthless sinner, come before the throne of grace? How could I, me? Dirty old me? It's like, no, no, your, your problem is that, you, that you're too proud to acknowledge that you're actually that dirty and you need him that badly. It's the opposite. It's not like, how could I come before you? It's like, how could I not come before you, Father? Because I cannot do it on my own. Freebie. You can give Brett credit for that one. There we go. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 14, it says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who is called, sorry, but as he who called you is holy, 
you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So holiness has come and made its home in you, and our job is to release the holiness that is within us. It's to let it out. When you were born again by the Holy Spirit, when He came and dwelled in you, that's called justification. You are justified. And a, a, a little thing that I learned is just as if I'd never sinned. So before the Lord, it's just as if you'd never sinned. You've been made perfectly righteous in Christ because it's not you, it's all Jesus. He did it, He applies it, He imparts it, it's all Jesus. But now the process that you walk out in partnership with the Holy Spirit is called sanctification. That's where that inner reality becomes an outer reality. As you, as you minister in your soul as a priest to the Spirit of God, that transformation takes place. And so we see this function then as priests and kings, and, and David is the greatest example that we have in, in the prototype leading up to Jesus, pointing towards him, of, of a king who was a priest. He operated in both of those functions. He was anointed as king, but he brought about a, a priestly function, a, a renewal of the priestly function in the church. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. He's made us a kingdom, so we are kings in the kingdom, but we've, it has made us priests before the Lord. I read this in a, in a commentary. It says, as we consider the Levitical priesthood, so this was the priests that were put the, from the tribe of Levi that were given the priestly order in the temple. It says, as we consider the Levitical priesthood, it's important to remember that although the tribe of Levi was set apart to perform the sacrifices and lead worship in the tab tabernacle and temple, God never intended the descendants of Levi to be the only priestly figures in the nation of Israel. In fact, the Lord originally called His people out of bondage in Egypt so that the entire nation would serve Him as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That's in Exodus 19. The priestly institution itself was needed only because the sin of the people had not yet been finally dealt with. And an intermediary, someone that had to kind of stand in the gap, was required between Israel and God, lest His holiness break out and destroy His sinful people. Only when the wickedness of Israel had finally been dealt with, could the people of God truly become that nation of priests that requires no Levitical mediator between them and the Almighty. Having sanctified and perfected us in His Father's sight, furthermore, through His offering of Himself, Hebrews 10.10. 10. Christ Jesus made all who are in him the priesthood that God always intended his people to be. No longer need we rely on an intermediary who is a sinner like us. Rather, the Lord has become the mediator between himself and his own in the person of the God-man, Jesus Christ. Amen? Hallelujah. So priests minister in the temple and kings minister in the marketplace. We are priests to God in us and kings for God through us. That's our role. Like that's, you, could, you could kind of boil down your role as, as a follower of Jesus is to be a priest and to be a king. Priestly first, kingly second, but it's the two of those things coming together. So as priests, we minister to God. You know, worship looks different for a priest. It's gathering around the presence, gathering around the altar of God. So when we come and we gather together, when we understand the priestly function, worship looks different. You may have found that as we worship, and I'm not saying we've got perfect worship or we know everything about what we're doing, we're stumbling through and just trying our hardest to be obedient to God. But what we're not doing is trying to cater for the people. We're trying to cater for the presence. So you might come in and go, man, these people worship for so long. And why, what's she singing? There's no, there's no words. How am I supposed to follow along? And man, are they seriously singing that song? Like I think their first song probably went for about half an hour, 40 minutes. Yeah. Oh, oh. What's she doing? 
As you know, how are, are they going to preach today or what? It's 10 to 12. I've got footy on this afternoon. I don't know if the footy's on this afternoon. It is. Sorry. Checked on my water. <laughs> I apologize. Now, listen, we're not, we're not being like, oh, stuff people, you know, do whatever. It's like we, we, we love people. We love God and we love people. So we're not trying to, you know, to say, oh, whatever. And, uh, you know, we, we care about that. But ultimately, the greatest care has to be for the presence of God, for the Father, that we come and we love on Him and whatever that looks like and wherever He leads us. And it's this weird thing where it's like, the Spirit of God leads us in how to worship the Spirit of God. When we come together, it's like, Holy Spirit, it's like, how do you want us to give glory to you today? Lead us in how to give the most glory that we can possibly give because you are worthy of all glory. Lead us today, Holy Spirit, in how to glorify you and worship you and praise you. Because He knows. Worship looks different for priests. Priests minister to God. Priests care for the temple. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, it says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. If Jesus paid the price for all of our sin, then really, is, is it a big deal if we keep on sinning? Because he's paid it all anyway. Well, it is a big deal when you understand that you're a dwelling place of God and that you've been bought with a price. So God has come. He's seen the house up for sale. He's made a purchase. You're no longer the owner of your body. You are renting that space and God has moved in and he is the owner. Now, in the same way that if you were to walk into someone's house and start throwing poop all over the walls and on the floor and on the ceiling, they, the owner probably wouldn't be too happy. It wouldn't be the kind of place that they'd want to spend a lot of time. But that's what we do when we sin. We just disregard the very dwelling place of God. And we wonder, why am I not hearing your voice, Lord? Why do I feel like you're not speaking to me, God? Why are you not, you know, why am I not feeling you anymore like I used to? Why can't I enter into worship in the same way? Now, if there's, if there's unrepentant sin in your life, you're making a mess of the temple. And that's why it matters. Now, is God going to strike you down and kill you and send, you know, burning sulfur on you? No, he's not. Is he going to punish you for your sin? No, he's not. He's not going to punish you. He's going to discipline you because he loves you. But you know what? God not feeling comfortable to dwell in the temple of your body, that should be a punishment enough for us. The consequence of how we behave, of, of what we put our mind and our heart and our hands to, the consequence is, is the impact that it has on the Father and the way that it grieves Him. That should be enough. Because there no, there, there's no consequence in the natural way. God's going to go, you did this, here you go, lightning bolt, strike you down. All the punishment for your sin was poured out upon Christ. So that the, the veil could be torn, so that you could enter in to the holy place with God. So that he could come and dwell in you. So that, not like Moses, that you could actually see his glory and not die. You could experience his holiness and not be taken out. So we're in this place that goes, okay, so I don't need to fear God in the way that he's going to strike me down if he catches me doing the wrong thing. But we should be in that place that we mourn the impact that it has on him when we choose to live in a way that he hasn't destined us to live and designed us to live. Now, again, it's not like, okay, I need to try hard. No, you need to humble yourself, repent, and come boldly before the throne of grace and mercy. Because it's not you. It's not about you trying harder. It's possibly about you trying less hard and letting him do the work. So the priests ministered to God. They cared for the temple. And we glorify God inwardly so that he can be glorified outwardly. God wants that he's, he's chosen you as the vessel of his presence. As I said before, you're the ark of his glory. 
Wherever you go, you carry the very presence of God with you. It's amazing. So people can encounter the reality of God just by meeting you. I don't feel like I have to tell you, but it's not about you. It doesn't make you, like, awesome. It makes God awesome in you. So priests minister to God, they care for the temple, and they glorify the Lord. They worship Him inwardly so that that is released outwardly. And the kingly function, essentially kings rule. Kings execute the plans of God. As I spoke last week about prayer, you know, prayer is about coming into intimacy, but out of prayer comes that declaration, that prophetic impact, that intercession, where we release the things that are on God's heart. We we release the things of the Lord and we execute the plans of God in the spiritual realm, in whatever area of authority that God has given you. Whatever authority you have, spiritually, it might be in your household, it might be in your neighborhood, it might be over a region, over a city, over a nation. Whatever realm of authority God has given you, He wants you to exercise that authority by hearing what He's doing and then releasing it into the earth. Kings govern regions spiritually through governmental authority. So the church, the ecclesia, that word for ecclesia in Roman culture, was the spiritual governing body of a city or a region. So us collectively, we are a spiritual governing body over whatever region God has given to us. So we get to determine what happens and what doesn't happen. You know, the Scripture says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. So that's like we have that authority to do those sorts of things, to cleanse the land, to, to tear down strongholds. Like that's what God has called us to be as a people. That's a whole lot of responsibility. So we need to be impressed that we're hearing rightly and executing rightly the things that God has. And in the same way, as, you know, that priestly function is glorifying God inwardly and the kings release that glory into the world. The glory of God that will cover the earth. But that's, that's our responsibility. God wants to use us to release His glory. So then what does it look like to become, you know, so we feel like God is really establishing um, a, a place, a dwelling place of worship and prayer and intercession in this community, amongst the other things that He'll do. But it's like what God prioritizes and builds into the foundation so that amongst every person, you might say, man, I'm an evangelist. I just want to be out on the street and just seeing the lost say, and I'm like, that's awesome. But if you're not God first, then there's, there's a problem there. I just, I, just, I just really, I just feel like I'm really pastoral, man. I just want to, I just want to get with people and love on them and help them on the journey. I'm like, that's awesome. But if you're not God first, there's a problem. I mean, I just feel like I'm out. like, man, I want to be out there planting churches and, you know, saving nations. And all this. It's like, awesome. But if you're not God first, you're not going to actually fulfill and walk out the things that God has because you're not hearing his voice. So you're doing good stuff, but it's not God's stuff. So a house of prayer establishes the order, the right order of God first. So when we pray, what we're doing is we're saying God first. I'm not going to go and do something, well, that didn't work out, better pray because I'm in trouble. Maybe you wouldn't be in trouble if you'd prayed first and heard what he wanted you to do because he's not going to lead you into trouble. And it also creates an environment for encounter. You know, I just, I just really believe that if nobody else does it, if no other church does it, I'm okay with that. But I just feel like God is saying, no, just create a place that I love to dwell and let people come and encounter me in that place. Like that's what I see is worship people who, who don't want anything to do with Jesus, going, okay, I'll come or I'll, I'll, I'll give in and I'll, I'll be there and encountering the reality of God because the presence of God is so thick and so strong and so real that they, they can't, but it's like, I, I, I've just seen him. I've just experienced him. I've just tasted and I've seen that the Lord is good. Yeah. 
So as I said last week, we don't pray so that God moves. We pray and minister to God because He is worthy of our adoration, our affection, and our worship. Prayer isn't about trying to convince God to do something. Prayer is about aligning yourself with what He's already doing. Prayer is an end in itself. Like it's not prayer unto something. Prayer naturally leads to something. You know, God's presence, like it naturally leads to something, but it's not like, well, we pray so that we can get on with the real work of what God's doing. Because eternity is prayer and worship before the throne of God. So there's other things that we get to do on earth. It's great, but your eternity is, is standing before God in worship. I would assume. And roller coasters and fairy floss and unicorns and all that sort of stuff. But So we can say, well, what about the lost or what about the poor? What about all the work there is to do? If we just spend all of our time in prayer, then nothing would get done. But I think if we spent more time in prayer, then a heck of a lot more would actually get done. Because we wouldn't waste our time doing a whole lot of good stuff that God isn't doing. You know, Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. John 5, 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord. This is Jesus could do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. So Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. So Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. What else did he do? Nothing. He only did what he saw the Father doing. Now, I don't think we need to go, Father, are you eating right now? Can I have something? You know? Father, are you going to the bathroom right now? Can I go too? Like, is that, you know, we're not talking about that kind of, I'm not trying to cause you to be a nutcase, okay? But when it comes to the things of God, doing what we feel like God is doing, Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. So we, get, we should as well only do what we see the Father doing. Anything of significance that we accomplish in life for God, He is already doing. It's why He deserves the glory for even the stuff that we do. Because like, I was, I, was, I was already there first. It was my idea. If God is doing it, then how can we lose? And too often the church ends up doing a whole lot of good things that aren't actually God things. Now, they're not ungodly. They're just not what God is doing right now. He may have done them in the past and he may do them in the future, but we shouldn't assume that we know the plan of God already and all we need to do is just get on with it. Uh, God's already told us what to do. Go and make disciples. Go and do this. Go and do that. Just love him. Do this, all that sort of stuff. So we've, we've got it all worked out. We've studied the Bible. We've figured him out. We know exactly what he's doing. So let's just get on with it. You just need to work harder, do more, accomplish more. We get caught up living by principles rather than living by his presence. Principles will get you so far, but His presence will get you to the place that He wants you. Don't assume that you know what God wants you to do. But do what He's doing right now. Do what He's doing right now. Because you actually can't do everything that Jesus commanded you to do all in one go. You're going to have to choose something, so you might as well choose what God is doing now and do that rather than bouncing around, trying to do all of these really good things, but not doing God things, what he's doing right now. Is that okay? Too bad if it ain't. God is leading us in this next season to establish this house of prayer, worship, and intercession. But what we build in the natural is designed to create a greater reality in the spiritual. So a physical house of prayer and worship is not the goal, but it helps for people to capture and experience the reality of them becoming a house of prayer. Like you are the house of prayer. When Jesus says, I want my temple to be a house of prayer, that's you. That's not a physical place. But again, we, we can mirror it in the, in the, in the physical because it helps for people to capture it. Oh, that's kind of what it looks like. Cool, now I get to go and live that every single day. Because you can spend, if you spent three hours in worship, that's only, a, that's only a couple of percent of your week, time-wise. 
It's individual, but it's also corporate. I'm a dwelling place, but together we are a dwelling place of God. So it talks about we're all being built up into this holy temple. Your, your stones that are being placed together to build up this temple of God. So what does it look like for us to live as holy temples? Well, it looks like living in a constant state of worship and prayer. So quit your job. Yeah, you're like, really? Okay, well, we need to understand what worship is. Worship is not an action. It's, it's the direction of our affection. So what's worship? It's the direction of your affection. It leads to action. But if you direct your affection towards the Father, it's going to lead you to want to sing about it. It's going to lead you to want to tell people about it. It's going to lead you to want to dance and jump up and down and lay down and do whatever. Like it's going to lead to something because it's going to encompass and fill every part of who you are. You're going to be so captivated by it. It's like, I have to tell someone about this. I have to sing about how good he is. But worship isn't, and I know it's just the language that we use. We have a time of worship or this, that, or whatever. It's, it, it's confusing. It's difficult. It's just cultural Christianity. And I'm so over trying to correct language and everything. So it's like, it's that. But hopefully you understand what we did this morning was worship only because people's hearts were engaged in affection towards the Father. Because if we weren't, then we would have just sung some songs. That's what we would have. We had a sing-along. Yeah, we just need a bouncing ball on the screen. We have a karaoke time. So we're good. But see, it becomes worship when people's hearts are captivated by the Father, when the direction of their affection is towards Jesus. Oh, now it's worship. So we can't assume, and we have worship music. It doesn't mean it's worship. It doesn't mean the people who are singing it are worshiping the Father. It doesn't mean they're not either. But, but what most captivates our hearts is the thing that we worship. So what's captivating your heart? That's probably a thing that you're worshiping. When Jesus talks about money, it's like you can't serve God and money. You can't have one thing captivating your heart and expect that God's also going to captivate your heart. You've got to choose. Worship and prayer is affection and communion. It's the state of our heart. That's what worship looks like. If you're worshiping God, it's all an internal reality. But then we would expect that it becomes an external reality. We don't just want to worship God on the inside. And the Bible is filled with people. The expression of worship, of people's worship, was all there. Singing, music, declaration, all of that sort of stuff. So we're not just saying, oh, we're just going to all sit quietly like a silent disco and, you know, worship on our own. No, there's naturally going to be an expression, passion, life. But it has to be rooted and grounded in the heart reality of worship towards God. Otherwise, it's a people, as the, as the Scriptures say, who's... Who's, who honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Oh, man, we don't want to be that. We don't want the church to be that. A place that honors God with their lips, but their hearts are somewhere else. Man. To live as a holy temple is to pursue righteousness. So as I said before, Jesus accomplished the work. We are justified, but we partner with him to see the finished work manifest in our lives. And that's the work of sanctification. That's why we go on so much about the heart journey, because that's where the righteousness of Christ will be manifest. It's, it's of internal becoming external. But a holy temple is one who we, we, we take care of our temple. We're aware of what goes in. Don't waste time ignoring the things of the heart. You know, I read that thing out of, out of Hebrews about, you know, the bitter root rising up. You know, offense and bitterness and judgment and all of these things that we just think, don't think that it's not going to affect you. If you have an issue with someone, it's affecting you and it's your sin. If you're offended, that's your sin. It doesn't matter what they did. They could be the biggest jerk on the planet. If you're in offense and judgment and unforgiveness, you're deep in sin. I think sometimes our response in our heart towards what other people have done can be far worse. And then we're blind and ignorant to it. 
Don't ignore your heart because it's part of the temple. Holy temples accomplish more by sometimes looking like they're doing less because there's no striving when you're doing what the Father's doing. There's no pushing, there's no pleading, there's no wrestling. I mean, they can be contending in the Spirit, and they can be partnering with God in that, but it's, it's Him. There's a grace for it then. If you're fighting against God, it's possibly something to do with pride in your heart because the Lord is opposing you. Holy temples will know what the, what the Father is saying and do what He is doing and see what He intends to accomplish through us. God wants to fill us. He wants to consume every part of us. But we need to recognize that it's not the responsibility of the church. It's not the responsibility of somebody else to care for your temple. It's, it's up to you because you are the priest and you are the king that ministers to God in you and ministers to the world through you. Like that's, that's you. Put your hand up if you're a priest and a king. Yeah. So it's, it's a big responsibility. But God's a big God and he's got a truckload of grace and mercy for you. So there's no condemnation. When you mess it up, when you make a mess of your temple... Guess what? There's grace and mercy for you if you're willing to humble yourself and come before the throne of grace. But it's a thing of ta- how, can we, how can we take responsibility and not get drawn into condemnation or, you know, or, or unhealthy kind of shame and guilt and those sorts of things, but go, yeah, God, I've, I've, got to, I've got to come back to that place and recognize, man, I can't keep making these decisions anymore because it's just defiling the very dwelling place of you. Why don't you stand with me? And we can all repent together. So I just want you to know I'm, I'm, I'm speaking this as a word to my heart. Thanks for listening in as an audience to, to God speaking to me. So I'm not standing here going like, I've got this down packed. Like this is something where we're living through, we're all journeying through and working through. Um, but it's that reminder that sometimes needs to come that God brings. It's like, just remember who you are. You've got to remember who you are. Thank you, Father. Let's pray. Yes, Father, we just choose right now to remember who we are, Lord. And it's not about how we feel. It's not about what we've done. But it's about how you feel towards us and about what you have done, Jesus. And we rest in that place. We are so thankful, God, for the finished work of Jesus Christ. As you cried out on the cross, it is finished. It is done. The work is accomplished and complete, Lord. And as we've received your Holy Spirit, as we've been born again, we have been made righteous in Christ. By the blood of Jesus that has washed us free from all the defilement of sin, God. And you have come, Holy Spirit, and you have made your home in us. And we are so thankful, Lord. We're overwhelmed by the reality, God, but we are so thankful, Father. But Lord, as, as, as you've come and you've made your home in us, Lord, we just want to look at that and go, man, I want to create the best dwelling place for you, God. God, stir the affection in my heart to say, God, I just want to make you feel so comfortable in me. I don't want to do anything that would make you feel like, man, I want to move out of this place. Because we know you never will. You're never going to leave us, Lord. You're never going to forsake us, God. But Lord, let us not take advantage of that, Lord, and defile the temple of your Holy Spirit through how we live our lives, Lord. But God, we don't just want to be watching out for not doing the wrong thing, Father. We want to be people who are pursuing righteousness, Lord. Pursuing the right things that you have, God. God, ministering to you as priests, Father, in prayer and in worship, God. Giving you the attention and the affection that you deserve and that you desire from us, Lord. We thank you that there's no condemnation for us who are in Christ. But there's glory, there's revelation, 
There's abundance. There's all the fullness of heaven dwelling in us, Lord. So, Father, we choose now to repent for the ways that we've ignored you, for the ways that we've defiled, either through thought or through deed, your dwelling place, Lord. And we receive your forgiveness, Father, because you hear our confession, Lord, and you're faithful and just to forgive us, Lord. But, Father, we want to choose, Lord, as, the, as we take hold of that repentance, Lord, and we want to walk out a different way, God, that we would leave this place today with a, with a clear revelation and understanding of what and who we are, Lord, that we are a, a dwelling place of the very Spirit of God and that we've been made holy because you are holy, Lord, and you dwell in us, Father. But, Father, we pray that that holiness, Lord, would be released from us, God. And, Lord, that we would walk in humility and come before you every day, Lord. When we feel like, when we feel like the, the last place that you'd want us to be is before your presence, God. That we'd take captive that thought, that prideful thought, Lord, and we'd come in humility and, and throw ourselves at your feet, your feet of mercy, your feet of grace. And we'll receive all that we need to walk out the lives that you have for us, Lord, to be good priests and to be good kings. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen.